So yeah, they just make you feel a bit, you know, more relaxed. So since I've been here, I can say, you know, my mindset has really changed. And So it's not just food. If you need literally any other help, they've got it here for you. It just put me at rest. It's, it's very good here, very good, very good. 100% argument. Hi everyone. Have you ever wondered what our food bank is really like? In this episode we find out, meeting guests, staff and volunteers. Recently one of them said, I literally thought you were just a tin of beans, but you are really so much more. The food bank's core purpose is the provision of three days emergency food to people in crisis. Starting in 2011, a few years after the financial crash, it worked from a porter cabin and helped 30 people a month. At the time, they thought this would be a short-term need and that it couldn't get any busier. Shockingly, it is now providing food for an average of 2,000 people a month from seven locations across Eastbourne, run by 14 staff and 130 volunteers. In 2021, Eastbourne Food Bank was one of the busiest in the UK. This year, from March to September, our food bank had provided food for 13,523 people. So the rise in demand for emergency food in our town continues, reflecting the growing number of people who can no longer afford to pay rent, priority bills and food. This includes single people, families, carers, pensioners and those who are in work. Each of these people has a story. First, we speak to Freya, Satellite Support Manager, who tells us about the unique approach they take to providing food to all those who come and visit. Well, I've been involved with Eastbourne Food Bank for six years and so I've seen it evolve. And the main area that I believe strongly in is clients, dignity and a sense of feeling heard. We want to encourage people to come in and relax and feel that they have the right to pick up the food that they need as opposed to choosing what we think people should have. So we set the food out on the table so that people can choose um, what they want in terms of their family set up, their children, what their children want to eat, what their cooking facilities allow them to cook. Um, there's no point in giving someone a food package containing foods that they can't use. And it's really important that people get to choose what they have. Um, I believe that laying the food out for people to choose, I have seen it make an enormous difference in terms of how our clients feel, the experience they're having, and our stock levels. Instead of giving away food that people can't use, people are actually limiting what they're taking to what they need. Yeah, I, I always say to clients when they take, when they take their food, um, take what you need, leave what you can. And that lands really well with people because we're putting the responsibility also onto them as to protecting our stock and, and really making use of the opportunity to put together a food parcel that can be, can be really effective for their family. And I also encourage people to understand that we're offering a hand up, not a hand out. And we're trying to offer people an opportunity to come out of their situation by, by welfare benefits advice, income maximisation and, and listening and autonom encouraging autonomous thinking. And if, um, if you could wave a magic wand and you could get some things to change, what would they be? that we wouldn't be here doing this, that I wouldn't be be here every day doing what I'm doing, um, that people would have enough money to be able to go to the shops and buy the food that they need. Jess and Juliet, who run campaigns and comms for the food bank, talk about cooking demos and how sometimes the guests just know better. I think the whole, whole, whole thing started with conversations about chickpeas, because I personally love chickpeas and, and use them a lot. Um, there, are, there are quite often chickpeas at the food bank and some people were a little bit nervous about well, what do I do with this? So there was kind of conversations with other guests about, OK, well, yeah, I use them. There was a, a, a woman who was talking about the Trinidadian doubles that she makes, which are a beautiful spicy chickpea. And it kind of extended out from that, really, that we saw, oh, actually, we can, really can have this conversation about what things are you cooking? What would you use this for? 
we were, we were uh, well it was me I'm going to own it it wasn't Juliet I was trying to do the Spanish omelette and actually we had one of our guests came and said actually I really don't think that's the best way to do an omelette so we and actually that was the breakthrough moment wasn't it and then he said and I said well, will, will you do it and he then cooked the omelette which was not a potato omelette in the end so the, the, the tin potatoes didn't get used in that instance but we did get a great omelette and we had somebody who's who's a guest here showing absolutely their expertise and that's kind of the aim behind all of it has been about We've got, you know, however many people there are here today, many, many of whom have been, you know, living really frugally for a really long time and have brilliant knowledge about how to do that, um, which I think there's real things for people in the wider population who we're all having to tighten our belts. There's real things for people to learn. We're, we're quite kind of versatile as well because we sometimes get stuff from allotment holders, which is lovely. So they send us um, their surplus and we have some fresh vegetables to use, um, which is really good because then we can, you know, people can come up with recipes and then people can take those um, those vegetables home and recreate that. Um, it's like it's less waste um, and, you know, different ideas. Do them publish the recipe somewhere where people can find it how do you so do um yes yeah, so, we, so we write them down um every week in a notepad so while the food bank guest is cooking we're chatting to them writing down what they're doing um, and then we take photographs of that um, and we put it out on social media um, and we also ask people on social media to share their favorite budget recipes um, and probably good to mention as well um is that there might be guests who've come to the food bank and needed the food bank but have then been able to um, not use the food bank one week but that they still want to come have a cup of coffee have a chat and cook something and that's absolutely fine because that social element is really important too next we meet one of the guests talking about how being able to choose food keeps way slow and the different feelings people have about using a food bank i come to the food bank mostly once a week um, it's good to come to this one at Langley because it's got the cafe and um, they also do food demonstrations as well which they let you taste the food with. Um, also, you know, it gives you an idea of what you can cook with as little as possible or leftovers and I think as well. It's actually better to come and choose your own products because um, otherwise I've been to others that just give you them in boxes and you end up taking half back because there's not what you can eat and everything in your family and what people don't like so it's good that it doesn't go to waste then at home. And do you find the cooking, you're talking about the cooking demonstrations, so do you find those interesting? Have you tried any recipes, anything you think you could contribute to people? Yeah, well, I actually um, tried something here a few weeks back and um, then they actually gave me the ingredients to take home and I cooked it at home for my family, so which was yeah. quite good. <laughs> Did they like it? Um, my husband did, but my six-year-old kind of turned her nose up, but that's what a six-year-old to like, aren't they? <laughs> How do you manage between, you mentioned going to the community fridge and, and it may not have everything that you want and obviously come here or go to the other satellites, how do you actually manage that process with the family? Because the community fridge is there every day so they have a variety of products that come in so you don't actually know, you just turn up and there's mostly like fruit and veg and um, then there's like cakes and bread um, but literally yeah I go there um, and then I come here probably once a week which has got more of the tinned products and everything yes. else. And what sort of things are on your mind at the moment? I mean we got, it's got colder for a start I mean we've already got a really high end huge bill already so we're on the electric <laughs> so um, it's just yeah trying to get through that and then spending your money on like your shopping weekly that's why I come here because it's you've got to pay your other bills and then can't afford to you know get all the shopping so you have to like top it up at these places so, which is really helpful yeah. I don't think people should have a stigma about coming to food banks and that because like in the past when I've been okay I've actually given stuff to food banks 
and then you know I need help so you know I've come full of help so I don't think people should have that stigma of like that you know even if you work you shouldn't come here because they feel ashamed they you know literally shouldn't not feel ashamed it doesn't bother me saying to people that I go to a food bank and yet my partner he gets embarrassed around his work friends that I go to a food bank, <laughs> you know, so it's just, yeah, they st still that stigma there, which I think people need to get rid of. Um, it's, it's not shaming, it's just people struggling these days because of the cost of living, literally. <laughs> Here's Nikki, senior debt advisor, explaining how she helps people manage their debts, and Robert, who is a senior advocacy advisor, helping people claim benefits they're entitled to. I'm the debt advisor at Eastbourne Food Bank, so when it becomes apparent that somebody's got some debt issues that they want to discuss, then I'm the person that deals with it. And what's sort of the main challenges that you're finding at the moment? Um, in regards to the clients, I think it's opening up, feeling ashamed and embarrassed mm. and not, sh not wanting to talk about it. Um, but again, Eventually, I think they realise that they have to talk about it and it needs to be resolved. I think if we're talking about the main issues that they're coming to us with, um, at the moment, of course, gas and electric is a main concern for a lot of people. Um, council tax as well is probably one of the main reasons why people um, come to me in the first place because they've got council tax debt, it gets escalated quite quickly and it gets passed on to enforcement agents pretty quickly. And once that's in place, it's quite an emergency for, for people. So it can't be left, it needs to be dealt with. So that's normally why they come to me, to, to try and help them with that and deal with it um, pretty quickly. And what's the sort of process? So if somebody comes and talks to you and explains they may not have all the documentation or, or you know, information, how does it move on from that conversation? So to begin with, as long as I've got their name and their address and, and they sign a form to say that I can act on their behalf, that's to begin with, that's pretty much all I need to be able to stop, if we're talking about enforcement agents, to stop that action happening. Um, and then I'd like them to come and see me at the office and we have like a full appointment to address everything. But with just a couple of details and authority, I can act pretty quickly in the first instance to deal with the emergency debts like, like council tax. We do support people to get back into work, so they might not be in work to begin with, but they could always end up being in work. But there definitely are more than what people expect, I think, that are in work. I definitely do have quite a few clients that are in work. I think maybe the higher percentage is not in work at the moment um, or have um, such ill health that they can't be working, and we will support with them with that as well. But, um, but yeah, I think more people, more and more people at the moment are in work and in debt. And if you had a magic wand you could wave mm. at the moment, what, what sort of things would you ask for or want? Um, gas electric prices to be more affordable, I think is definitely the first one. That is one of the main issues we have. And secondly, um, I think it would be council tax. Um, I think it would be to either A, make it more affordable, um, or B, for our council to make the bills to be zero for some people um, at the minute you have to the minimum they can accept is for everybody to pay at least 20 percent of the council tax bill and that can still be quite high for people on very low incomes uh, other councils around here they do give zero percent council tax bills so i don't see why we can't do it if it's acknowledged that it would really make a difference to some people um, they are the, the, even the people that have 20 percent they are still the debts that are going to enforcement agents so if people are still struggling to pay that 20 percent I think it's quite obvious that um, more help is needed there. Um, I think it's just that if anybody is struggling with debt or, and is maybe ashamed to speak to somebody, just to go and talk. Um, it, it, there's, there's lots that we can do to help um, and it, maybe it's not as scary as you might think it is. So yeah, that's my message, to speak to somebody and there's lots of people out there that can help. So I'm, my name's Robert and I'm a welfare benefits advisor for the food bank. A lot of people don't claim the right benefits that they're entitled to. Uh, a lot of money is not claimed during the year. I think a figure of £15 billion has been mentioned, uh, which is an awful lot of money. So um, a lot of people we see are not claiming the right benefits. So we help them to get the right benefits and hope that they won't need to use us in the long term. So that's really my role is to try to maximise people's income from benefits so they don't need to use us. Uh, they can sustain themselves over the longer term. And how many people would you see? I mean, how busy are you? 
Well, as you can see, it's been really quite busy today. Um, you know, I haven't really had a moment. I've been kept busy for an hour and 45 minutes. And uh, of course, I can't always do all the work in that particular period of time. So I might call people back, get them to come in next week and see me. So if I need to help them fill in a form, for example, we're here at the same time every week and they don't have to go into town. Uh, to see somebody. They don't have to do it over the telephone. It's very immediate. We can do things very quickly and um, you know get immediate results in many cases too. So it's a good way of doing this I think. So what do you find are the main barriers or reasons why people don't discover the benefits or the right benefits for them? Quite a lot of older people we see are reluctant to claim benefits because they don't think they're entitled to them. They don't think they ought to get them. They don't understand the qualifying conditions. Some of them are quite proud about it. And it takes a long time to encourage them and talk them around to claiming the benefits that they could claim. Um, a lot of people just don't really understand the benefit system. It's really quite complicated. And the forms that they have to complete are quite long and onerous. I mean, once you're experienced at doing them, it, can be quite simple. It can be quite a simple, quick job, you know. I've seen a lot of people here over the last 12 months who don't claim council tax reduction. And I think you've been speaking to one of my colleagues about council tax debt. It causes a lot of council tax debt and a lot of misery, I think, for people. Um, and a lot of people I've seen here are not claiming it. And one of the reasons why they're not claiming it, I think, is because following the introduction of universal credit, council tax is no longer claimed with housing benefit. So housing benefit is used to pay rent. And I think people think maybe it's still included in universal credit. They don't realize it's a single separate benefit they have to claim separately. And that may be one of the reasons why they don't claim it. Some councils have a different approach to it. In Eastbourne, even people on universal credit, on the lowest rate of universal credit, will have to pay 20% of their council tax. So it might not seem like an awful lot of money to some people, but it's, you know, averages out at probably about £25 a month. Now, you know, if you're only getting £75 a week, it can be quite a large proportion of your income. What I like about the food bank, particularly, is that rather than say to people, you know, you may qualify for this, why do you get a form? You know, we'll fill the form in for people. We'll actually do it for them, you know, while they're here. So they don't have to <clears throat> ring somebody up and spend, you know, an hour on the phone trying to get through and then an hour on the phone going through a form, which a lot of people are just going to give up on. Yeah. I mean, I think we're ahead of the curve, really, in many ways, the food bank, because we can do that. You know, somebody doesn't have to come into town and see us or call us they can come here and it will be done straight away in many cases. And it can take, what, 15 minutes, you know, it's not a long time. And and I would often pop it down to the town hall when I get back to my office on Grove Road. So it's very efficient, you know, it's very quick. Next, we meet two guests, candidly telling us their story and what being part of the food bank community means for them in dealing with their daily challenges. We actually made a food bank yeah. through a, uh, yeah. well, a lovely lady who uh, teaches people how to sew and stuff, yeah. doesn't she? Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I was introduced by a family friend and she mentioned about it. So initially you're thinking, oh, a bit, bit dubious. Where well, you are though, aren't you? You're thinking, you know, am I a bit of a failure? Mommy, Is it a bit embarrassing what will people fly. think? But it, it couldn't be any further from the truth, really. And it's like a social thing as well. It's nice to get out. And the one on, I used to go to the one on Monday, but then you had to queue and you had to stand and, you know, there's like health problems going on. So obviously that was uncomfortable. So this one here, you can actually come and have a coffee. You can sit down, you're comfortable, put your name on the list. Then they come and get you. But also they've actually uh, helped me out financially, you know, getting rid of old debts and stuff. So Nikki has helped me out. She's been an absolute star. Um, so it's not only for food, it's like social things as well and for financial. And they try and help you out with stuff anyway, don't they? So, you know, and it's good to meet other people and get out. Sometimes people are like in their own little bubble and don't get out too much. Obviously, if you're not financially viable, then you don't really get out as much as you should do. One time I met a guy that actually works with mental health 
you know, and he was able to advise me and give me numbers, you know, for like a hotline I could speak to. And it, do you know what I mean? I just, every time I came here, I didn't have any expectation, but it's like I left here either like knowing how to deal with something or just feeling that little bit better. Yeah. So it, honestly, in terms of my mental health, I came here and honestly, I met amazing people. So, it's, you know, it's a broader spectrum from coming again a few tins of beans and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a social thing and the financial help and the advice and it's just nice to talk to welcoming people. Exactly. Would you agree, young ladies? 100%. Well, I'm glad about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'll never, you can come in here and be having the worst day but you leave here not the same. Mm. You leave here feeling a bit more, you know, I can actually get on with it. And do with the challenges that you Yeah, have. and it, it's just so reassuring because yeah. honestly, it's hard. Mm. It's hard, and especially the times that we live in. I mean, life happens, you know, and like, you know, unless you're in, you're in that situation, you'll never know. So the mindset was cross that bridge when you get there. Life is like a train. One minute you're on a high, one minute you're on a low, and you know, I came from having such a good job, you know, good salary, being okay, and then having my daughter and just life just completely changed. You know, and not to, like people are naive about these things, but it does happen. And when it does change, you're either stuck in the, you know, the mindset of, okay, but my life was like this and I used to live this way and this is how I know. You have to adjust and that's the hardest part, adjusting to your new circumstances. And I feel like I guess that's what made me think, no, I can't go to the food bank because I was okay. I had a good job. I'll go to my local supermarket and buy what I need, you know? But having another factor now, which is my daughter coming into it, I then realised quickly that it's not the same anymore. You know, I'm in a different time in my life and just this is just how it is. And I shouldn't be ashamed to get help. And yeah, and like I said, I don't even just come here for the food anymore. I come here because just what it does for me mentally. I come here and I speak to other people. And like I said, it's been a journey. It's also been like a, a bit of a therapy. Because I can tell you, a couple months ago, I was always here crying. Like, I, I was just always sad. So I've really seen my progression. I've really seen my journey and so far. And I couldn't be happier. And you're never alone. You're actually never alone. Lynn is a volunteer at the Food Bank and is chatting here about the benefits of volunteering and recognising the skills of guests in living frugally. Hi, my name's Lynn. Um, I'm a retired university lecturer. Moved to Eastbourne about eight years ago when I retired. Um, and I've been working at the food bank since then, really. I, I do two things. Uh, one is I work in the hub, which involves actually distributing food to people who come in. And the other is uh, quite fun. It's working in the warehouse, which is basically moving big crates of baked beans around. I quite enjoy that. And how many hours a week do you tend to volunteer? I do two mornings um, which involves maybe three hours each morning so six hours in, in all. And what's, what are the main things that you've noticed about the food bank while you've been working here? People talk about people being in food poverty. It's really no such thing as food poverty there's just poverty and that means that people can't afford food but they can't afford toiletries, they can't afford school uniforms, they can't afford things for their babies etc. The food bank, in order to respond to people's needs, has had to expand its, um, its work to becoming something that to me looks like a shadow social services department. When social workers need um, prams and buggies and cots and things like that, they'll come to the food bank for them. In that you know, we all want to help but I think we're all very aware that by helping, we're also popping up a system that is really not working to the good of the people. The clients who come to the feed bank will tell you about their circumstances. And typically, it's, um, there might be uh, single mums with two, three children where, where childcare makes it impossible for them to work, even though they'd be desperate to work. 
um, a lot of our clients are carers. Um, looking after elderly parents sometimes, but very often looking after disabled children. So that seems to be a big area um, that, that's problematic and uh, stops people from earning. I think absolutely everybody I speak to here says that the field bills are causing them problems. Um, and it's not that they're splashing the cash on other things, leaving them short. They've, without exception really, they, uh, they've explored all the possibilities for getting extra help. They know exactly to the penny what they're paying in the direct debits. They know exactly to the penny what their benefits are. And they know exactly to the penny what they've got left over at the end of the week. Um, so it's not that there's a magic pot of money somewhere that they're not accessing. There, there just isn't anything. Here a guest tells of the preference for using a prepaid energy meter to avoid racking up debts, giving to the food bank when flush, and coping with ups and downs of life. Yeah, and we've all got we've prepaid all got meters, meters. Yeah. because we are they want and I'm and I'm old, I'm fifty six. I don't want a big bill a bill coming in at three hundred eight hundred pounds or because where am I going to find that in one year? But it is what it is. People say to me, don't have it, but I, I don't want an 800 pound bill. No. I bet if it comes from my door, I can't pay it. Yeah, yeah. So. That brings peace of mind for you, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I don't want to be in debt. Yeah. I don't want to be. My son's got mental health and he's not well, he's under St Mary's and that. I don't want to. I've got to be strong for him, but then I don't want. I don't want that thing of worrying all night about debt and the bailiff's going to come and all that. You know, like, you sit on the telly, you don't want to be in that. You, everyone wants to float above water and not drown. That's what I think. You know. I mean, obviously the weather's got slightly colder this last yeah. week. Has I've been watching that there's, yeah, I've been watching there's a, there was a good programme on Channel 5 about 30 tips how to save electric, you know, like put an extra layer of clothes on, like use a slow cooker and things like sort of like helping people as well. And they've, uh, one week I come here, they gave all everybody slow cookers. They're very good, very good mm. here, very good. You know, I couldn't praise them enough. Mm. They're very good. When I've got loads of money, I donate. I put stuff in the, in the shopping, in Tesco's, I put it in the... You know, we all, it all goes round. Well, you know, we all help each other. Exactly. That's what it's, that's what you got to do, isn't you? That's when I'm flush. You know, when I'm yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only come in when I need it. Like just just that. You know, say at the end of the month now, mm. and I'm stocking up on the. I'm putting my money on them keys. Next, Juliet and Jess explain their mission, a legacy to build a community that outlasts the need for a large-scale food bank operation in our town. It published recently that the the use of the food bank in August uh, this year was 121% up on August 2021. It was. So, um, I mean, what impacts does that have for you in terms of capacity or services or demand? What are you seeing happening? Um, it's. I mean, it, it's a big concern. It is a big concern. And... Um, of course, we know that things are going to get more difficult in the um, in the winter. Um, we we will keep going and we will provide support um, while it's needed, and we will be there for people. Um, but obviously, we believe that we shouldn't need to exist. That food banks um, on a large scale shouldn't be here um, and that one day we can close our doors or close the doors on large scale food yeah. banks because we should have a strong enough social security system that ensures everybody has enough money in their pockets to afford the basics to keep themselves fed, clean, shelter. It's just the basics really. It's quite profound sort of hearing and, and seeing what's going on around us. Um, but the sense of community that's building here, the atmosphere, um, the fact that people are contributing themselves, so you know, their ideas, how to cook, their ways of managing in a, a frugal way, uh, a sense of community and friendship, all those things. But... Um, and one of our aims at the campaigns team, we have kind of three sections, which is changing policy, changing communities and changing minds. What sort of what sort of mindset or what sort of things do you want to see change when you say changing minds? So um, I think changing minds around um, around the issues of poverty. Um, we we have I think it might be a, a common 
thought. I've heard people say it before that um, people need to learn to budget, people need to learn to cook, um, and actually you can't budget if you haven't got any money to budget with. Um, and that I think we've proved here that it's absolutely not the case that people don't know how to cook. There's lots of people are having to make brilliant meals um, with food bank ingredients, um, and it turns out they're really tasty because we try them every week. We'd like to say a big thank you to everyone that spoke to us. We hope this has given you an idea of what our food bank is really like. We met a community of people navigating difficult changes and circumstances with skill and resilience, supported by brilliant staff and volunteers, a community of friendship, kindness and respect. We know times are tough for many, though if you can, please donate to East One Food Bank. Below you can find their website linked to do this and learn more about accessing help.